Vidal, we will now uh, move on to take uh, questions uh, from uh, the journalists uh, with, uh, if you please, a focus on the two issues of the press conference, uh, GPR report and victim rights strategy. I first pass the floor to Joe Barnes. Joe. Thank you, Eric. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Well, lovely. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to point back at the kind of the racial equality stuff that you discussed this morning. Um, and Commissioner or Vice President Yorova mentioned working with regional areas. Um, so t would that now be an ideal time to kind of evaluate whether traditions such as uh, Zwarte Pete or Black Pete are kind of relevant and acceptable in a modern European Union? And then uh, specifically to uh, Commissioner Reinders, um, do you regret taking part in events where you use makeup to blacken your face? Um, and would you use this time now when the, the question of racial equality is kind of at the forefront of our lives to actually apologise for that um, and people you may have offended? Maybe to say that, uh, yes, it was already possible to apologise for such a situation, but it was a good opportunity uh, to make uh, a real evolution because you know that it was uh, uh, an association, a charity association to help children in difficulty in Belgium, and now all the members of such an association are working in Brussels, not more with only the black colour, but the three national colours from Belgium, black, yellow and red. And so it's a good opportunity to say that in such an occasion, it was an opportunity to change a very old tradition in my home country. And now if you have the opportunity to be confronted with the members of such an association, you will see they will walk in the city with three colours on their face. And it's a very good evolution, I'm sure. Yes, thank you very much. At, the, today, at uh, today's discussion uh, on racism, we, many of us repeated that uh, we face some kind of structural uh, racism. That's, uh, it is something which is very complex, which is also based on, on uh, the racial prejudices, <clears throat> and that we have to use all the tools available and all the partners available to <clears throat> combat this uh, very uh, unfortunate and terrible phenomenon. So uh, we discussed about the role of education, the role of media, culture, but also indeed we spoke about the regions and the cities because uh, according to many surveys we have also from our funda fundamental rights agency, we see that uh, racism appears as a, as a big barrier for, for many people in Europe in uh, relation to housing, in relation to education, in relation to public services, Services, and many of these uh, uh, sectors or many, many of, of these spheres are uh, managed or are, are under the, the management of the regions and uh, local communities. That's why we believe that this is the right way to invite them also first for the discussion and then for taking the, the concrete measures. Also, it has to be mentioned that uh, the regions uh, in many countries are the managing authorities of our EU funding, of cohesion funds and of EU European social fund. And here we would really like to see the money better used and better, uh, more helping uh, to decrease the level of racism and to help the people to have equal opportunities, in, in especially in, in education. Uh, because here we speak about the young generation very much. We need to prepare better perspective for them in Europe. And uh, here I think the, the work of the EU funding uh, should be more and better used. Thank you. Let, let me now move to Alexander. You have the floor. Can I speak? Yes. Can I speak? Yes. Super. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to touch upon uh, uh, one particular line in the, in the communication which I found very interesting. And um, it, it, it is about the, um, that the largest big tech companies, multinationals, um, are established in Ireland and Luxembourg. Um, and this has created a kind of some tension within the data protection regime. Um, because um, the Irish authority in particular now has, I think, at least 12 major cases against uh, Facebook alone, which it, it has been working on for the past two years, but it hasn't concluded any single of these cases. And so 
Um, the question is, uh, would you say that the, uh, you find the data, Irish Data Protection Authority to be sufficiently resourced, um, that you find that the uh, co cooperation with other authorities is, is, is the way it should be? Um, and do you, do you think that, at what point do you think that a failure to conclude cases will, will you know, be damaging to the overall uh, application of the GDPR? I want to say that the data protection authorities are fully independent and the Commission has no uh, tools to uh, push them to speed up, uh, but uh, the cases you mentioned, especially the cases which relate to big tech, are always complex and they require thorough uh, investigation and it uh, simply requires more time. Uh, but we are expecting some, some big cases to come soon. Uh, when you spoke about the tension, of course the one-stop shop mechanism which is in the GDPR uh, uh, expected, the, especially the Irish DP and also the Luxembourgish one to be more and better equipped uh, with the staff and with the budget uh, because there was expected uh, uh, that uh, they will have a much higher number of cases and especially these big and complex ones than, than some, some others in Europe. So we saw an, a considerable increase of capacities both uh, in, in Ireland and, and Luxembourg. We saw increase in, in uh, at least half uh, sufficient increase uh, at least in half of other uh, member states' DPAs. And uh, so we, we have to uh, let them do very responsible and good work and, of course, wait for the results. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add that, of course, the best answer will be a decision from the Irish uh, Data Protection Authority about uh, important cases. It will be uh, the most efficient answer about your question. But it's true that we have seen an increasing of capacities in the different national authorities, but we need to uh, analyze the situation maybe deeper to see if it's needed to do more in some member states due to the size, of course, of the companies at work uh, in the jurisdiction of such a national authority because we have huge differences between the member states about the, 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 the need to react uh, to the, the request from the companies. And of course, we need to reinforce the cooperation and the coordination on cross-border uh, issues. And we need to, to be sure that it's possible for all the uh, national authorities to work together. And in the network of national authorities, it's the case. And with the board, it's possible to organize that. So we'll continue to work on it. It's true that we need to verify if there is a real uh, good size, if I may, of the human resource and the financing of the national uh, data protection authorities with the importance of the companies located in their jurisdiction. So it's not only a question to have the same kind of approach in all the member states. It's also to be uh, fit to respond to all the demands coming in your jurisdiction. And it's true that in some jurisdictions we have more and multinationals and more uh, members of uh, high-tech companies than in others. Thank you. Let me now move to Thomas Miglierina. Thomas. Yes, thank you. I hear you're waiting for the Shillings to uh, decision on third countries in the Court of Justice. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? The decision is supposed to take place on the 16th of July. What is going to happen after that? Uh, the case is still open on one or two points, uh, and it might ha have to wait until September before it is concluded. What's the situation there? Well, this is a specific Swiss point, but it's also a general point. Generally speaking, the ruling from the Court of Justice uh, in the Salem to uh, case is a very important one which will have repercussions. It depends on what the ruling says uh, 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 and what recommendations it makes. Uh, 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 now, on the more specific question of Switzerland, Swiss legislation on data protection dates from 1992. Uh, now, they've uh, uh, tried to 
bring it into line with the 1995 regulation at that time, but a lot has happened since then, a lot of water under the bridge, particularly the GDPR, uh, which we've now had put in place in the European Union to organise the question of DPA. So it's not just the court ruling, uh, but what would be very helpful for the um, Swiss authorities to make process, progress on the modernisation of the tools for DPA and strengthening the DPA authorities uh, uh, to see uh, if they can do that. I think it will be easier for us to uh, make sure there is... Uh, uh, an equality of approach between what happens in the Swiss Confederation and what happens in the EU. Uh, and obviously, uh, the action won't take place immediately after the court uh, uh, ruling. We'll need a little bit of time to read through the recommendations before we take action. Yes. Mrs. Jorever, do you want to add? Move to the next question. Okay. Um, Catherine, we move to you. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Catherine Pure, EU reporter. Uh, firstly, a question for um, Vice President Jourova. Uh, David Frost, the UK chief negotiator, has said that there is no doubt that uh, the UK will be data adequate at the point of exit because we're operating the same system. I wonder if you share his confidence um, uh, in that statement. And I have a follow-up question to Commissioner Renders on his uh, comments on uh, his black face uh, uh, and, how, and how he seems to be justifying it on, um, because he was doing some sort of charity work. I mean, wouldn't it have been better to give a response like Justin Trudeau, who said, darkening your face, regardless of the context and circumstances, is always unacceptable because of the racist history of blackface. And then he went on to make an unequivocal apology. Isn't that the right response? Mrs. Yorke. Yes, I remember very well the United Kingdom being very active uh, partner when we were discussing and adopting the GDPR. And uh, it implemented GDPR, as far as I know, in, uh, in full or with, uh, with full respect to, to the common rules uh, for data protection in the EU. Uh, but I cannot predict now whether it will be so easy and without any further negotiations needed for the possible adequacy decision, because... Uh, we uh, do not know whether the UK will not introduce some changes in their national legislation uh, which might deviate from the general line of the general data protection uh, regulation. So if the systems are equal or essentially equivalent, of course the adequacy decision can be uh, taken, but, but for UK it is uh, too early to say because uh, there will be uh, a number of talks about uh, this issue. Just maybe just to come First of all, I don't want to repeat what I have said, but uh, just uh, to insist on the fact that I have explained the context of such a situation some years ago, but uh, it's also, it was also the good occasion to change the way to organize the process for such a charity association. And again, you will see now that uh, all the members are walking in the streets and in the restaurants of Brussels with three national colors. It's maybe a, a good change if it's possible to change all the kind of uh, behaviors in the EU and outside the EU, it will be fine. About UK, I just want to say that if we receive all the information that we are asking for UK in the negotiations, it will be possible maybe to move forward. But we need to have a very concrete understanding about the situation in UK before to take a decision, of course, about the possible inequality. Thank you. Oliver, we move, we move to you. So, hi. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we hi. can hear you. We can't see you, but... Uh, I don't know if you can see... Ah, oh, hang on, sorry. There I am. <laughs> uh, thank, th thank you for this. Um, I, I, I would still like to come back to... Oliver came with the Austrian newspaper, Die Presse. I'd still like to come back to the question of uh, my colleague Thomas Miliarina. Uh, no, and actually of, my, uh, of the question before concerning Luxembourg and Ireland. So if I understand you well, you're not worried that uh, the big tech companies might be 
sort of using the fact that that it's national data protection authorities who are in charge of, of, of dealing with complaints um, as a sort of um, well, kind of attack point against the EU by simply registering in Ireland and Luxembourg and then counting on the fact that, of course, for example, a German or a French data uh, protection authority would simply, because the country is bigger, uh, have different resources than the ones in the small member states. So that is not an issue for you anymore. Um, I'd be interested in, in both of your views. And then secondly, sorry, an unrelated question, but it relates to air travel uh, and the behavior of airlines we've seen and the complaint by Test Asha that uh, many airlines now are so cash strapped that they actually sell plane tickets, which they never really uh, plan to really um, honor. Uh, Commissioner Randers, you, you told Euronews that the Commission is ready to start infringement cases um, if it sees fit to that. Could you be more precise to the, to, uh, in that regard? Are you worried about um, member states or companies not honoring the passenger rights laws in the EU? Or do you think that this is abusive market behavior that is actually unfair trade practices by companies? Thank you. Mrs. Jorza. I will very briefly uh, reply on the, on the DPA's issue. Well, uh, if we are worried, uh, we, we have no, no right to be worried. We have to guarantee that the, the, we, together with the member states, we have to guarantee that the data protection authorities are well equipped and that they have sufficient capacities uh, to do the job. So uh, the adequate capacities uh, were uh, discussed before GDPR came into force. Uh, the start was not easy. I am aware that the people were overburdened. I, I spoke to, to the uh, uh, head of the Irish Data Protection Authority, but also I, I got uh, very her uh, very strong commitment that they will increase the capacities and the budget so that to manage the number of complex cases. So this is, this is ongoing and uh, uh, I think that uh, it's part of uh, the good functioning of GD GDPR that the enforcers uh, have sufficient capacities to do the job. The second question isn't uh, strictly linked to the debate, but maybe you'd like to answer. Yeah, that of course, it's true that we are monitoring the situation about the resources, all the national uh, data protection authorities, but there is also a network. And so it's possible to exchange among the different national uh, data protection authorities about the views that they have on one of another issue, and that's uh, a, a good way to do that. But it's not true that we, don't, we are not concerned about the situation. We'll continue to monitor the situation in the resources of the different national uh, data protection authorities. Mm -hmm. About air travel and about the package travel directive, the same. Uh, first of all, we have uh, published a guidance to explain that uh, we want to protect the consumer rights because we have, uh, at the Commission level, given a real flexibility to the member states to provide liquidity through state aids, to give an example, to the uh, airlines companies or to the two operators. If they receive liquidity, they need to take care for uh, different kind of uh, stakeholders, but certainly to the consumers. And it's the right of the consumers to be reimbursed and to make a choice, reimbursement or maybe if you, the consumer wants to do that, to agree on a voucher. But there is a right to be reimbursed. And of course, when I was speaking about infringement proceedings, because we have asked to all the member states what the situation is about the full respect for the EU law in one of another member state. And we have seen that there are some uh, contradictions with, uh, uh, between the measures taken during the emergency period in the COVID-19 crisis in some member states and the EU legislation on the passenger rights and on the uh, package travel directive. So if we have such a kind of uh, contradiction, of course, we will introduce infringement proceedings. So we are preparing that on the basis of the analysis of uh, the services on uh, the different situations in the different member states. And uh, of course, we analyze uh, also the situation now because you mentioned another kind of process. It's not just a, a possibility, a possible contradiction between a national measure and the EU law. Here, it's maybe another kind of uh, practice from the uh, airlines companies, and we'll see if there are some possible actions also against that. But it's true that we need to be very uh, um, concrete about the way to react. And again, when I'm speaking about infringement proceedings, it's for the contradiction 
between some national measures and the EU law. We want to protect the right for the consumers to be reimbursed if they want to be reimbursed by the airlines company or by the two operators. Thank you. We now move to Thomas Oleka. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the floor. Uh, I have a question on the application of the GDPR. Uh, I remember that one of the most controversial and discussed points was the so-called right to be forgotten that then was replaced by a more general right to erasure of results uh, on search engine websites. Uh, I was wondering, do you have any available data on the application of this uh, specific rights uh, of uh, citizens? And uh, who is asking the most uh, uh, to be removed from uh, search engines and uh, for what reason? And then I have a second question, if I may, on uh, racism. Uh, this is for Commissioner Reinhardt. Uh, as you probably know, thousands of Belgian citizens are asking for the removal of the statues of Leopold II. Uh, I would just remind that uh, during his rule of the Congo, more than 10 million Africans died uh, as a result of uh, colonialism and crimes. Uh, do you think, uh, what do you think about this request by the citizens uh, to remove the statues? Uh, do you agree with them? Thank you. Who wants to answer the first question on data? I don't have the exact data. I don't well, we don't have uh, figures with us now, but it's possible to provide you maybe some figures uh, later uh, to answer to your first question. About the second one, of course, you mentioned uh, a national situation. Uh, I'm sure that the most important element is to work on the colonial uh, past of many European member states. And you know that at the national level there are some uh, proposals to work with, uh, in different member states, a new uh, uh, analyze of the past and the colonial past of the different uh, member states. But in one member state in particular that you have mentioned, the idea is to work in the Parliament with a specific committee in charge of a presentation of the situation of the colonial past and to say what are the, the results of such an analyse. I'm sure that we have maybe to think about the same kind of process at the European level. What kind of discussion about the uh, colonial uh, history of the different member states and then uh, what kind of better respect for the diversity of our societies and that's uh, the main issue of course it's not only to have a better memory of the past it's also to uh, go uh, in a better situation to go to a better situation about the uh, uh, respect of the diversity in our society of course uh, you mentioned the, the, the request to remove some statutes or to change some names of streets and I'm not sure that is the best way the best way is not to uh, try to have a new uh, version of the uh, historical past of one member state. It's more to uh, insist on research and debate and analyze on the memories and then the best, way to, uh, best ways, maybe, to organize uh, a full respect for the diversity in, our, uh, our, in all our societies. Thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. I first move to Stéphane Israel. Oui. Vous m'entendez Oui. Oui. Yes. Thank you. A follow-up question to Commissioner Reinders, a follow-up to Thomas's question. You mentioned the um, equivalence decision and Switzerland. The uh, reform in Switzerland has already um, advanced fairly far. It should be concluded in September or October. Could you at least say whether it's moving in the right direction? Does it go far enough? It might be uh, good to know so now rather than later. And secondly, the framework uh, agreement that, the, that Switzerland and the EU are currently negotiating, is there a link there? Well, I don't think uh, there needs to be a general link between the general framework agreement and the um, equation decision, the uh, main thing is to uh, strengthen the uh, a, a, a 
decent situation with data protection in order to um, organize exchanges. Now, of course, uh, we're not going to express ourselves on uh, text that is currently being uh, negotiated in Switzerland. What I can say is that in several countries, in particular EU countries, the direction that is being taken is strengthening the um, DPAs and the strengthening of the Swiss DPA of, does move in that direction. It's uh, about putting in place a stronger um, authority which uh, is open to uh, citizens and to supporting citizens. But of course, it's up to um, Switzerland to come up with its text. Go ahead. Press the famous speak button. Okay, we seem yes. Okay, we seem yes. We had you there for a second, James, so we know it's working. Yes, I'm I'm seeing Can you hear me now? Sorry, I can't hear. Um, we seem to have a problem, James. Sorry for that. James, sorry for that. Uh, one last try. Go ahead. One last try. Go ahead. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear me. Right. Okay. I can't hear you, so I'll rely on others for this. Uh, Commissioner Reindeers, two two quick questions. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. So. Well, I'm sorry about that. Well, I'm sorry about that. I can hear you now. I can hear you say I'm sorry about that, but I can't hear you uh, okay. previously. Okay. Listen, we'll move um, on to somebody else, James, we'll because else. we're running out of time. Um, Vincent, last question. Uh, hi. Uh, two questions on the GDPR. Can you hear me? Go ahead. We can hear you. Go ahead. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first question is, can um, either, <clears throat> either commissioner confirm whether the um, assessment of the UK's data protection regime uh, has started? Um, and secondly, um, could they provide any more details on which countries might be targeted for infringement proceedings um, for failing to uh, um, apply the GDPR? No, uh, I, I, I want to, to repeat maybe about UK that we are in discussion with UK in the negotiations uh, between UK and the, the European Union and managed by Michel Barnier on our side. We have discussions about uh, all the different issues and on the uh, exchange of uh, data and transfer of data, of course, we try to receive more and more information about uh, the, the situation in UK and the, the, the regulation in UK to be sure that it's possible to go to an adequacy decision. So it's too early to say when it will be possible. It will be maybe a part of a more global agreement on other issues. But I want just to insist on one fact. It's a unilateral, unilateral decision of the European Commission. So it's not a part of an agreement between UK and uh, the European Union, it's a real unilateral decision to take an adequacy decision. And we will try to do that as soon as possible on the basis of the exchange of information that we have for the moment with the UK delegation. About the infringement proceedings, of course, we don't have a list for the moment. We are, uh, I've said, and uh, Joava said the same, we have uh, a list of uh, countries where we try to see if it's possible to reinforce the uh, possibilities for the national authorities to have enough resources, human resources, financial resources, to organize a better cross-border activities. If at the end we see uh, that there's a, a real problem about the enforcement of the GDPR in one member state, we will propose to, to go maybe to the court with an infringement proceedings. But we don't have for the moment a list of countries uh, to uh, organize such a kind of process. Okay, thank you very much um, to uh, you, Vice President, to you, Commissioner Reinders. Uh, we have run out of time, unfortunately, so thank you for your attendance at this press conference, and we resume tomorrow with the normal midday briefing. Thank you very much.